Grace and peace to each of you. The choir will be coming there a little late this morning, so I'm going to go ahead with our announcements. You'll note in the uh, that we have the friendship registers in the center of each aisle. If you'll sign them and pass them on to those who are seated next to you, that we may have record of your attendance. This morning, immediately after our service of worship, we will have a congregational meeting for three purposes. One is to hear the financial report of 2019. The second is to hear the proposed budget for 2020 and to address changes in the pastor's term of call. The third is for the election of one elder and who is Bart Manus to fulfill an unexpired term there and also for the election of one deacon, Angie Simmons, who will fulfill a two-year term for her brother Rob. So those are the purposes for our meeting immediately after our service. What we will do is um, have during the closing hymn, if any of our guests would like to stay, you're most welcome. If you would like to leave though at the closing hymn, that will allow us then to reconvene our meeting immediately afterwards and conduct our congregational business. We also are faced with two more vacancies um, in our leadership team of our elders and deacons. Um, Renee Gravel, after her death here this week, and also Mary Barstow, um, who is living now in Florida and will not be back with us. So we, we, we will need to reactivate the 2019-2020 nominating committee for those two positions. Then on Tuesday of this week, um, wait a minute, at 1.30 this afternoon, there is a missions committee at 4 p.m. SNF. And then today at 4 p.m., there will be a Martin Luther King Jr. worship service at Mount Zion Baptist Church. And all are welcome to that. On Tuesday, I will be traveling to Guatemala and will be down there as the chair of our Presbytery Committee in partnership uh, it, they have asked me to preach, and this will be the first partial sermon that I've ever preached in Spanish, and so I'll be doing that, but also having a good translator to help me with the rest of the sermon. But um, this is our 25th anniversary of our relationship with our sister churches in the two presbyteries down there. So we'll be doing some planning ahead, uh, some celebrating about that, and that, uh, then I will be working with the Men in America curriculum um, in several churches. I've got four different uh, gigs, if you will, in uh, teaching the Men in America curriculum down there. On January 27th, there is an announcement in your bulletin about a um, special speaker at the very bottom of this page here on the left side. Everyone is invited March, uh, January 27th at 6.30 to First Baptist Church of Valdez to hear a survival story of a uh, Holocaust survivor, Dr. Walt, Walter Zipper. Zipper. Uh, Dr. Zipper is one of the absolute last remaining survivors and is very, uh, he's a professor and he's also um, very able to tell that story in a way that is very engaging. This will probably be one of the very last opportunities any of us will ever have a chance to hear a Holocaust survivor. So you're encouraged to go to that. It is free and available to us. And there's also the announcement in the bulletin about the plans for our celebration of the Edict of Emancipation. One word about that, because we're moving the venue from the winery this year to the LPDA, we have a limit, a limit of 90 tickets for sale. So if you are interested or if your family is interested in coming and being there, it will literally be first come, first serve through Gretchen. Um, I don't know if Reed is gonna be doing that or not, but certainly Gretchen uh, Costner will be receiving that information and, and recording the names of people who want to attend and who will buy the tickets. Thank you, and now let us prepare our hearts for the worship of God.
Join me in the call to worship. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Look, God's chosen one who calls us each by name. Come and see, the Lord is here. Our hearts are made glad by God's grace. Praise the Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, is who is merciful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Join with me now in the prayer of confession. Baptizing God, by water and the Spirit, you anoint disciples and witnesses, prophets and teachers, to make your reign known throughout the earth. But we deny your claim on our lives and pretend we have no part in proclaiming the good news. You call us to testify to your grace. We fall silent. You call us to declare your truth. We shrink from speaking out. You call us to point others to Christ. We fade into the crowd and hope others will take the lead. Forgive us, Lord. Send your spirit upon us and reclaim us for your work so that our words and deeds might glorify you. Take a moment of silent confession. John in the wilderness said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Christ is with us. Christ dwells within us. Christ is our peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>
How you guys doing? Don't I look important? Look how tall I am. You don't think that since I'm taller, I'm more important? Are you serious? All right, all right, wait, what about now? What about now? All right, now, now I look more important, right? I don't. You know, you know, sometimes we think that if we're tall, we're important, or if we're strong, then we're important, or if we have a nice big hat, that we're important. But one thing that we're learning about today is when people saw Jesus, some of them did not know how important he was. What's that mean? That means that Jesus looked normal, like us. Jesus, if Jesus was sitting out here in the crowd, you might not say, oh, that's obviously Jesus, look how tall he is. You wouldn't say, oh, that's obviously Jesus, look what his clothes look like. You would actually look out and say, where is Jesus? And see, in, in the scripture, we find a lot of people walked right by Jesus and they never knew they were walking by the Son of God. Hmm. Sometimes in our lives, we are very close to Jesus and he looks very normal. That's something that we always need to remember. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for these children. We ask that as they go to school and as they are at home, that they recognize that you are with them in the very normal parts of their life. In Christ we pray. Amen. <laughs> As a pastor, I can't recall a, a season when we've had more tragedy in the life of our church. When we think of 
Dawn Hess's death at age 68, David Owens is 63, and now Renee Gravel at 67. When we think of Mary Barstow, who has gone to Florida and unable to return to us, Matt Jones, who had a severe stroke on his left side and is fight facing paralysis, and then Moa Moa's uh, death just eight days ago. When we think of church members like Don Waldrop and Spotswood Neal and Ed Blaynott and Harvey Jones and Gunnar Harbison, all facing cancer. I can't recall a time when we've had more concentrated loss in the life of this church since I've been here. But we also want to remember those who are in our nursing care centers, Claire Demeter, Maggie Simmons Hughes, Mary Sherrill, Janine Garou, Al Alberta Benus, Billy Britton, Rosalba Shook, and Carol Felker, all in area nursing care centers. Are there other pastoral concerns that any of you all would like to? Yes, Annette. Thank you for reminding me that. I just learned just a little while ago that Pat Pond's sister died this morning. And so uh, Pat and Chuck are unable to be with us and plans obviously are incomplete at this point. Um, in regards to Renee's service, the plans are that we will have a memorial service on February 8th, which is a Saturday, at 2 p.m. here in the sanctuary and a receiving of friends in Pioneer Hall afterwards. Anyone else? Uh, yes. Yes. Roger Hebner's mother is in at College Pines in, in uh, in need of our prayers as well. Anyone else? Let us turn to God. You know the heaviness of the hearts in this congregation, O oh Lord, at this most recent death of our sister Renee. We had just ordained and installed her to the new role of an elder this past Sunday. And she had gone down for a heart procedure and but because of pre-existing condition with an aneurysm, it became very, very threatening and took her life. Our hearts are heavy, O Lord, and yet our hearts are with you for you have given us the gift of salvation helped us to realize that joy is not temporal, it is eternal. It is given to us by the Lord of life for us to claim not only in this life and the life that we live every day, but also to claim for those who've gone before us so that as we remember them, we remember that they are now whole and living with you in the glory of your eternal life. So we claim that reality, O Lord, in boldness, in our sorrow. <coughs> Not only for Renee's family as they are here this morning, but also, also for others in our midst who are grieving. We claim it for those who are in our nursing care centers and who are in need of reassurance and remembrance from us in our lives and the busyness of our routine, let us remember them. We claim it, O oh Lord, as we live our lives by faith on this Martin Luther King Jr. weekend in which we recall the importance of justice and righteousness that he lived and died for. And we ask your blessing to be a beacon of light in this nation and to guide our lives as witnesses to peace and to justice. We claim the gift of your love, O oh Lord, in, for those who are embattling cancer and who wrestle with the reality of broken bodies and 
the struggle with trying to recover from a recent round of poison in their bodies, which is designed to bring them health and wholeness eventually. We look to you, Lord, for life is tenuous, life is uncertain, it is fragmented, and we ask for the assurance of your everlasting love to grant us wholeness, a wholeness we can't give ourselves, a wholeness that we walk with you, and a wholeness that you promise to all who call on you. So we claim that gift as we join together our voices. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And so the focus of our scripture reading this day is on the Lamb of God. And we turn to God for direction as we prepare to hear again the meaning of God's word. Heavenly Father, we ask that you strengthen us in your goodness, strengthen us in your joy. For we seek to understand the meaning of Christ as Lamb of God, and we live our lives with expectancy and hope. These things we offer in Jesus' name, amen. John 1, 29th verse. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. <clears throat> This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him. But the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look! Here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translates means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two heard John speak and followed him, was following him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John, you are to be called Cephas which is translated Peter. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, that's one of those metaphors that many of us have heard and been familiar with most all of our lives, if we're cradle Christians. Some of us are more recent to that understanding of Jesus as Lamb of God. It's a reference not only to Jesus it is also one that perhaps many of us fully don't quite un understand. The title, Lamb of God, originates with the foundational event of the Exodus story of the Hebrew slaves coming out of Egypt back in the days of Moses. We recall that the Hebrew people were told by Moses to mark their homes with lamb's blood over the doorpost so that the angel who they feared, an, an avenging angel, would literally pass over that house. Scripture tells us that this was the time when the angel brought death to the firstborn males of every Egyptian family as a way after many, many efforts to encourage the Egyptians to release the Hebrew people. Lambs were slaughtered by the Hebrew people, and the blood of the lamb was splashed on the door, and the flesh of the lambs was cooked and eaten in haste, along with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. And every year since that event, we call that Passover. And it's a commemorative meal that is observed to this day in Jewish traditions and even in many Christian traditions. 
During the celebration of Passover, we recognize God's deliverance of the Hebrew people from Egypt and the redemption of God's people from the pursuing Egyptian army. Passover commemorates the creation of a covenant nation. But with the coming of Jesus in the New Testament, we see that the meaning of Passover and the lamb used for sacrifice, also called the Paschal Lamb, P-A-S-C-H-A-L, Paschal Lamb, changes. And it takes on new layers of spiritual relevance for those who follow Jesus. John, here in this chapter, in this passage of scripture, makes a connection between the man Jesus in our text and the Lamb of Passover by calling him the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And with that one statement, Jesus, Lamb of God, takes away the sins of the world, the whole theological meaning behind the Lamb of God changes. And we move from an Old Testament understanding of deliverance from slavery and God's redemption of a persecuted people, what we might call a communal salvation. But with the coming of Jesus, the Paschal Lamb, those same themes take on deeper meaning. The theme of deliverance of Jesus as the Lamb of God was reinterpreted as deliverance from the enslavement of sin and leading to the ultimate redemption, the transformation of death's control over our lives. There's a redemption. In the New Testament, in Jesus' life, it is a total redemption for all who call on him as Lord and Savior. Freedom of life eternal. It is available for all who call on Jesus. Jesus builds on the imagery of the Lamb of God with the meal that we call the Lord's Supper. Whenever we have this meal, we talk about partaking of the Lamb of eating the bread, the body of Christ, of drinking the wine or the blood of Christ. And those spiritual themes then take on a deeper meaning for us. Now let's consider how that symbolism translates into impacting our own lives. And to do this, I want to concentrate on one word that we see used over and over in this text. It is the word in Greek, menos, which literally means to stay with or abide. The Spirit of God descended with and remained with or abided with Jesus. Secondly, the two disciples in the story ask where Jesus is staying, where he is menosing. Where is he staying? So they came and they stayed with him. Now if we take those incidents translated as staying with and use the term abiding with, then we understand the prominent theme developed in this text. Listen again to the question Jesus asks when he encounters these two disciples. What are you seeking? And they respond with yet another question. Where, Lord? Are you menosing? Where are you abiding? Where are you staying? And he responds with an invitation. Come and see. It is an invitation to discipleship. Come and see. Be part of me. Abide in me. And I abide with you. And he responds then with a story not only of calling and witness, but of seeking and abiding. Peter and Andrew and later Philip and Nathaniel are being called to abide with Jesus, invited into a deeper relationship with him, invited to abide with the Lamb of God. So what are we seeking? What are you seeking and looking for in your spiritual life? Most of us truly long for a level of abiding with Christ and with God that we don't have in our own lives. We want the redemption of forgiveness, 
the deliverance from the struggles with our own mortality, the struggles with our own sins and faults and shortcomings. We want the promise of eternally abiding with God. With Christ, we find acceptance and safety, forgiveness and reassurance that we are, we are profoundly loved. That longing to abide with God is the very presence of the Spirit within us that is unhappy, unfulfilled, until we're united with Christ, abiding in Christ. It is that longing that compels us to be connected. Ministers of Word and Sacrament in the Presbyterian Church in any denomination are frequently asked to tell their call story especially when being interviewed for a new call in a church. But articulating a sense of call is not just limited to pastors. It's something that all of us experience. I want to share with you, as I was thinking about this this morning, it came to me that in my own call story, oftentimes when I've been asked that question, Sometimes I go back to when I was seven years old. When a neighbor asked one day, and many of you have heard this before, but had asked me, Kevin, what do you know today? As a seven-year-old, I just said, I know that Jesus loves me. What, what was I saying? I know that he abides with me. I wouldn't have thought that as a seven-year-old. I just only now thought it as a 64-year-old. But think about that. When we know that Christ loves us, we know he's abiding with us. He's present. So that becomes a part of our call story. And that call story then takes on new layers. The older we get, the more involved, the more we respond and say yes to God. And so you all know the story about the calling that I feel, not only to be here as your pastor, but the calling that has been within me for 25 years to address domestic violence, to, in recent years, just in the last three or four since Charlottesville, that calling has been heightenedly awakened in regards to race relations. And I feel called to do more than I've done in the past. God has a way when we are called in our own lives to challenge us. And in each one of those cases, those both of those cases, even all three of them, when I came here, I felt called. Why? Because I, there was a an element in that call of an awareness that Christ is abiding with me. I am following him. And so when I became your pastor, I know that I was following Christ to stand beside you, to be a brother with you, and to serve in doing things together that we had not imagined in 2007. To abide in Christ is to recognize that God's love is faithful to us. <clears throat> we lack nothing. Imagine that. An awareness that you lack nothing in order to be who you're called to be. If you receive that grace, if you open yourselves to the presence of Christ abiding. And Folks, the truth of the matter is we all need that assurance, reassurance again and again and again. Even after 35 years as a pastor, when I feel at times pulled in many different directions, I look for the reassurance that Christ is still with me. Well, you say, you know, you've been at this a long time. You would have figured this out by now. It, ain't, it doesn't work that way. Why? Because we're human. We can look at 47 ways in which things worked out well, Christ was with me, 
And yet when a new challenge comes our way, we need to know Christ abides again with us. And that hadn't been taken away. Behold the Lamb of God, John says. He's with us. He abides with us. Why be anxious? When Christ has abided with us in the past, he's with us now. We all wrestle to discern with wisdom what needs to happen with our lives, and that's part of the reason we struggle with that sense of abiding. Because every new day presents a new challenge that we hadn't yet confronted in our lives. And because we're human. But to know that the one who is grace and love incarnate and who stands with us in all that we do will not abandon us, will always be with us, gives us courage and hope to live our lives by faith. In the 15th chapter of John, Jesus comes back to this theme of abiding again. He says, abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branches cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Our life force as Christians is Christ, is abiding in him as the vine that brings fruit into our lives, a fruit of, of bearing the gift of love with other people. The God who have, has called each of you into your own lives of ministry, whether it be the principal of a school, whether it be a teacher in that same school, whether it be your responsibility in dispensing prescription medications, or whatever your calling and your walk in life, God abides with you there, present, encouraging, giving us strength. Perhaps in those times when we feel overwhelmed by life, we need to hear God in Christ say again, I am with you, come and see. Come and see what future we will have together. Not go it your own way. Come and see. Simply remain with me. You know, oftentimes we don't give ourselves permission for that, to remain with Christ and not have to do 47 things. Just to remain present with Christ. The call remains before us. Yes, it's out there, and we'll get back to it. But right now in my life, it's okay. I need to remain. I need to be present and abide with Christ in my life because he abides with me. Together we possess every spiritual gift, you and I, every gift we need in order to live our lives. And when we bring those gifts together, as Christians working with each other, we discover new ways. Christ reveals new ways for those gifts to be used for the benefit of the world. We need to be faithful to God, <coughs> abiding in the Lamb as he abides in us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please just stand and join with me in the affirmation of faith. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick, binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this.
raised Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. Friends, behold the Lamb of God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated. Let us join together in our gifts of love and gratitude. for giving us Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. We ask you now to use these gifts for the bringing of your wholeness to the world. For we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.
be seated. Mr. Clerk, do we have a quorum? All right, let us open our meeting with prayer. Heavenly Father, as we gather this day for the purposes that we have shared in this meeting, we ask that you will guide and direct us with your wisdom and your truth but also direct us forward as your covenant people in all we do. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. would like to call Gunnar uh, and John forward, if either one of you, I don't know if, if Gunnar's doing it, uh, Gunnar forward to share with us the 2019 financial report, uh, which if you have any need for a bulletin um, about this, there are ushers that are in the back that are prepared to hand you one if you'll raise your hand if you'd like uh, a copy of the report. Gunner? Okay, thank you, Kevin. Uh, before we start to take a look at, uh, at the Let Love Lead with the budgets from 2019 and 2020 in it, first I want to take an opportunity to uh, thank the congregation for your wonderful generosity uh, year after year. It not only shows how caring and loving you are for this church and your church family, but also it reaches out into the community, your support of all our programs, and the ideas that come out of this church reach out not only in the community, but out further into the world spreading Christ's love. So uh, I want to thank you for your generosity. Okay, let's, uh, let's start by referring, if you'll open your pamphlet, the inside two pages show the budget from 2019. I do want to say that the budget in 2019 came out right on target. It not only was, was good and came out right on target, but it, we're going to finish the year actually with a surplus this year. One of the couple of things I want to draw to your attention, in the first block here where you see income, if you look, at the very last line, it says 2.5% endowment and draw, withdrawal. Each year, whenever the committee does the budget, they are allowed to use to up to 5% of the five-year average of the endowments, not including the current year. The committee has been really good at being conservative and only using half of what is allowed for them to take from those endowments. And that money is used to help balance the budget, to support programs and things, and it helps to balance the budget. As you can see, this year, we were allowed $48,173. Now, if you look on the next page at the very bottom, somewhere you see year-end financial outcome, you'll notice on the average and shortfall, we see a shortfall of $41,966. If you subtract that amount from that endowment withdrawal, you'll get a $6,200 surplus. So we actually finished the year with a surplus this year, which was really good. Uh, if you'll take a look at the other blocks, like the programs, you'll see the budget there for each one and how each committee did. Our committee chairmen were really good over the last year at staying within their budget, coming in right in or a little under. Some might have gone just a little over, but they did very well. Uh, we met all of our benevolence obligations and other things, so uh, the 2019 budget turned out well. Now, if you look on the very back page, you will see the budget for this, for this year. Uh, you'll notice that the total revenue for the budget is $529,396. That's an increase in our budget for this year over last year. Uh, one reason is we're seeing a trend with our giving and pledges that's a little higher than it has been. It's just a trend we're thinking. And uh, also I wanted to mention that before 2018, we were actually seeing the trend was slightly downward. But over the last two years, 2018, 2019, we have seen that level off and seems to be stabilizing, maybe even a trend to slightly move forward or upward again, which would be really good. Also, one of the things we look at when pledges and things start coming in, we look at the age groups that are giving the different amounts, and of course our older congregation members still are the age group who are supporting most of the budget when they're giving. Uh, however, we did notice this year 
that the age group between zero and 40 was up just slightly, just a little bit, which is encouraging that that age group is able to start giving and pledging a little more than they have in the past. Also, one of the things we looked at uh, as we looked at this was we, we've changed uh, our meal prices. That was uh, another thing that we looked at uh, to be able to add a little to our budget. Uh, the two and a half percent endowment withdrawal is higher and that's because our endowment investments are doing well and the numbers worked out that we were able to take a little more money from that this year. Uh, if you look in the next block down to all of our programs, uh, you'll see that uh, the biggest increase is going to be down in the second blue line for personnel and David Fletcher is going to speak with, with you about that in just a minute. He will bring you up to date on some of that. Uh, I will say all of the committees did get at least what they had requested in their budgets from the year before. They got at least as much as they had gotten in 2019. Uh, some of them got a little more, some of them stayed the same or didn't get quite as much. Uh, they didn't always get what they asked for, but we thought it was fair what, what was given when we were doing the budget. Uh, a couple of exceptions to that rule are uh, fellowship is down just a little, and that goes back to the thinking of we're charging a little more for meals, so that allowed to put a little bit less in that budget. And uh, also, uh, you'll notice the office expense is down some. Our office is becoming more and more efficient and using email and different electronic things for our, uh, we're not using much paper and ink and postage and those kind of things, so the office expense did go down just a little bit in what we budgeted for them. Overall, I think it's, it's, it's a good budget and I think it will serve the church well. Uh, the committee has worked very hard on it, as they do every year. If you get a chance to see one of the SNF committee members, thank them for the hard work they do and they try very hard to be very good stewards of the church's money and contributions. So I think this budget will serve us well. And uh, if, you, if you get a time at home and don't have anything to do and want to look at a whole lot of numbers uh, and have a question about anything, if you'll contact me or one of the other committee members, we'll, we'll do our best to try and answer any questions you have. So uh, that completes my report. And at this time, I will yield to David. One thing I'd like to add to that, if you look at missions committee combined with benevolence and then realize that's still less than half of the benevolent giving that this church offers. Benevolent giving includes our pantry, it includes uh, the five cents a meal offering that we have every year. There are a number of other ways that we generate revenue that goes to particular outreach ministries of benevolence. And David, um, we welcome you as a chair of personnel and for your report. Thank you. The personnel committee unanimously recommended to the session, and the session approved the following regarding our uh, employees. These employees received a 2% cost of living salary adjustment for 2020. Our office manager, our DCE, our organist accompanist, our part time maintenance staff member and our pastor. We'll talk about change, term, change in terms of call in a minute. Uh, we had one employee uh, receiving a 2% cost of living salary adjustment plus an increase from 25 to 29 total hours per week and that's our director of music. One employee not receiving a salary adjustment doing, due to being a recent hire within the last year. It was our kitchen coordinator and we had one employee receiving a previously agreed upon increase in salary when she moved from being a contract employee to a permanent employee, and that's our financial secretary. All of our staff received a substantial Christmas bonus, and we want to thank the congregation for contributing to this campaign. Mr. Clerk, I invite you forward to for the next portion of this meeting. Uh, if you will conduct this meeting in my absence. musical chairs here for a minute. I'm going to ask David to come up and state his motion and then I'll come back up and we'll vote. Thank you. On behalf of the session, 
I present a motion to change Reverend Dr. Fre Kevin E. Frederick's 2020 terms of call to reflect a 2% salary increase. The terms of call change reflects a compensation of $81,863. This is exclusive of Board of Pension contributions. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. I hope we didn't lose anybody. <laughs> uh, we have any questions, any comments on the motion? Okay, we'll vote. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. Motion carries unanimously. Bringing Reverend Frederick back in. <clears throat> Pastor Kevin, I'm glad to say that we passed it unanimously and just a little way of us saying how much we appreciate all the work you do. Thank you. And I hereby turn the meeting back over to you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, John, and thank you, congregation, for your vote of support. We have one other item of business before us. In fact, there are two parts to this next item, and I'll call forward Carolyn Williams, who will share with us a report of the nominating committee. Mr. Moderator, the nominating committee would like to present the following names and recommend them for church officers class of 2021. And if you'll please stand for Deacon Angela Simmons and for Elder Bart Venus. Bart has been serving as the chair of, uh, well, has been serving as an elder and will be the chair of the property committee for the next two years. But we only appointed him last year, uh, elected him last year for a one-year term. So he's fulfilling a three-year term with this election. And Angie is fulfilling uh, an unexpired term uh, for Brother Rob, um, who, uh, and so we invite her into that role as a new deacon. Are there any other nominations from the floor? You all may be seated. Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion that we approve both of these. I will do them one at a time. Um, for Deacon, um, all those in favor of Angie, please say aye. Aye. For Elder, all those in favor of Bart, please say aye. Aye. And then with that, the motion carries. and. Um, Bart has been installed, and so we will not reinstall him, but we will reinstall Angie at a later date. Uh, we do have still two vacancies, and unfortunately, um, the work of the 2019 nominating committee does not end. Um, it continues until we find those two vacancies fulfilled. With that, we are, is there any other business? Uh, Mr. Clerk, that needs to come before the session or before the congregation at this time. All right. I'll entertain a motion that we adjourn our meeting. So moved. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. All right. All those in favor, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the constancy of your abiding grace, your abiding love in Christ as our lamb, as the one who shows us the way to salvation. We ask you, O oh Lord, to direct us in our actions, both in this congregation. We thank you for the support of this church and for its financial support of the ministry. We thank you for the volunteer support that exists in so many, not only these new leaders, but also in each volunteer, each member of this church who has been called by you to abide in you. So we ask you to go forward with us as we leave here this day. May the peace, power, and peace of our risen Lord be and abide with us all, now and forever. 
Amen.